I met Nate the jun my junior year at University of North Carolina. He was on the football team and I was on the swim team. And the football team was coming over for a party at our house with the swim team girls. We were gonna watch X-Files. It was a Sunday night. And um, I, they were coming over because the current quarterback at the time, who was ranked very high in the country and was a candidate for the Heisman Trophy and was super hot, Chris Keldorf. And he gets mad when I say was, but he was super hot. Um, he was dating my roommate at the time. And so he came over and he brought a bunch of friends. And I remember a bunch of these guys walked in and then this one guy walked in. And to say it was not love at first sight would be an understatement. Uh, he was wearing FUBU sweats. He was wearing a tight tank top. He was 305 pounds. He was 6'5", and he was a defensive lineman with a red goatee, and he had a dip in. <laughs> I didn't see a future with us, you know? But I remember that night, his intensity was high, and his passion, and his, the way he talked about things was like big. And I saw something in him, nothing I was attracted to, but I saw something <laughs> in him. And I was like, I don't know what this is. And so as the night went on, I really don't remember much about him. I just remember it ending with him, like with an empty Coors Light box on his head, dancing to Usher. And, and that was it. And then for the next three weeks, and one of my roommates is here, there she is, um, he would leave messages on our answer machine. And that's back then when you'd share an answer machine for the house. And they'd be like, hey, this is Nate Hobgachitic. Kelsey, tell the guy you're with, you're with me now. Click. And it went on like that, like day after day. And looking back, that was harassment, you know? <laughs> and at some point though, I don't know if I remembered something in his eyes or his soul, but I was like, I'll go out with you. And so I remember he had to save up. He was super broke. He worked at a gas station during the summer and he was a bouncer at night on Franklin Street. And so he took me to this really fancy restaurant. And I remember we sat outside for like three hours and it was just the deepest, coolest conversation I'd ever had. And at some point he was like, let's dance. And it was only weird because there was no dance floor and there was no music at this place. But I remember we went out there and we swayed around a little bit and then he excused himself to go to the bathroom. And um, when he went to the bathroom, there were some fraternity guys that came up and they were like, hey Kels, are you dating Nate? And I was like, well, dating's pushing it, but we're here, you know, and they were like, um, you look like Beauty and the Beast. <laughs> and I thought that was, I thought it was mean, you know, and I was like, I don't know if I should tell him, I don't know him that well, maybe he's gonna get angry, he's a football player, but I've never been one to keep a secret. So um, <laughs> when he came back from the bathroom, I was like, hey, listen, when you were in the bathroom, those guys over there, they said that when we were dancing, we looked like Beauty and the Beast. And he looked at me, and he looked at them, and he looked at me, and I was like, oh no. And then he just pulled me in for this big hug, and he whispered in my ear, don't you ever let anybody call you beast again. <laughs> so fast forward 21 years of what was, in all accounts from my perspective, a phenomenal life. Um, I had everything I wanted. And I had been very uptight about getting it. I'd spent my entire life controlling every step of my life. And every time I got somewhere, I'd be really grateful for it, but I'd not want to lose it. I remember in about 2015, I was, um, I, I thought to myself, this is it, we've done it. Our kids were at that great age where they can take care of themselves and they can stay at home, but they're not into drugs or sex. And, you know, we had, we had gone through some really tough financial times, which every NFL football player has to. And we, we were coming out of it. We were at the good point in our life. And I should have been happier than I've ever been. But I remember being like, why am I miserable? I was miserable. I had this, I had everything I wanted, but I just had this feeling inside like, is this it? Is this all I'm here to do? Like, what is this? And I found myself starting to live smaller and smaller. I started being more cynical, more judgy. I just was angry. I was nervous all the time. And looking back, that, that feeling made me start on what would end up being a two-year kind of spiritual reckoning um, that if I, if I know now, somehow that was my intuition telling me, get ready. 
So when I started to get this, um, this feeling of just unsettled, it actually manifested into tons of anxiety and panic attacks that would happen at night. And just, I couldn't put my finger on it. I ended up going on kind of a, a journey of reading books and started meditating and praying and talking to people about what is this that's happening. And through this spiritual journey, I read a book called The Code of the Extraordinary Mind and it rocked my world, it rocked Nate's world. We gave it to our best friends, Tony and Toby. They ended up reading it and through all these miracles, Tony connected to Tony connected to Vision, and we were offered this opportunity for myself, Michelle, and I to go to this uh, retreat in Jamaica for four days that was just about living your best life and showing up and, and the impossible being possible. And it was this awesome retreat. I really wanted to go, but my anxiety was super high, especially around travel. So that night I said, Nate, I can't go. I can't go to Jamaica. I can't leave. And I remember he looked at me and he's like, I can't do this anymore with you. I can't live with this woman that's, that used to be so fun and so happy and so outgoing and lived big and had all these big dreams and now you're living smaller and smaller and you're afraid of everything. He's like, you've got to show up for your life. So go and be all in. And then I want you to come back a different person. You're stronger than you think. I said, I love you so much. I've always loved you. And thank you for always being my number one fan. Thank you for reminding me this life isn't about comfort. It's about pushing the edge. I'm gonna go and I'm gonna go to Jamaica and I'm gonna be all in. We headed to Jamaica and it was almost like those realities had already passed. Whatever was gonna happen, happened. And I spent the next four days having what I would say were the best days of my life because for the first time in my life, like most of us, I had lived worried about stuff I'd done or said or worried about what was coming. But for some reason, when I landed in Jamaica, I just settled in. And I remember the last day, the Saturday morning, I woke up and I went to listen to a speaker and this guy's name is Wim Hof and he's insane. I mean, the way he spoke, he was on stage, he might've been drunk, I don't know. The guy was so entertaining because he didn't care what anyone thought. He just shared his story about doing things that most people would never dream of doing. And one of the things he would do is through breath work and meditation, he would hold his breath and swim under glaciers. But I remember at the end, he said he got on this path because when his children were young, he had four kids, his wife had died and he had lost all sense of what mattered. And I remember thinking that would suck. Raising kids alone would suck, right? But I remember being inspired by him. So that morning after he was done, I went out to the ocean and I remember thinking, I'm gonna hold my breath from like some like swimming area. I was gonna hold my breath and I got in the water and I remember I started to swim and I, it was so quiet and there was nobody else out there and I literally could feel the divine around me. I could feel for the first time in a long time that everything's okay. And if you knew the timing of when Nate died and you knew the time of that swim, it would blow your mind. But I remember I came up out of the water and I thought, I can't wait to show him what I've learned. This is when the story takes a bit of a turn. Things happen pretty quickly after that. I got out of the water, I changed, I grabbed my phone, I got a text from his best friend, Chris, um, and it said, call us ASAP. And um, I called, I called Michelle, and um, she said, listen, do not do what you do. Okay, everything is fine. Nate got up this morning, he took the kids to Sky Zone around nine, and then he fell. I took a breath, and in that breath I said, he's dead. I remember a couple months before he died, I would walk on the Manhattan Beach beach, and I would just call to the universe God, and I'd say like, use me, serve me. And I would listen to these songs, and this one song I kept listening to had this line that said, we're all one phone call from our knees. And that was mine. And I got on a plane by a miracle, and there was miracles, just so you know, there's miracles all around you all the time when crisis happens. If you see them, it'll blow your mind. But I got on the last flight, on the last plane back to the United States. And when I got on the plane, I went into full shock. I started throwing up, I was dry heaving, my body temperature was dropping. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't function. Um, so I was freaking out and Everyone was kind of ignoring me. And then about 20 minutes after we had taken off, I felt this hand on my shoulder and I looked back and it's this beautiful African-American woman. And I don't know if she was from Jamaica or the South, but I'll never forget. She put her hand on my forehead and on my shoulder and she said, um, she said, baby girl, I don't know what you are going through. And I do not know what waits you on the other side of this plane but I want you to know right now, you are not alone. God is with you, 
I am with you and there are people all over praying for you. And in that moment, I realized I couldn't bring Nate back, but I sure as hell could decide how I was gonna deal with him leaving. So I spent the next nine hours getting really clear on who I wanna be today. I already saw her, this girl right here, I knew who she was gonna become on that plane ride because in that moment I decided my kids had already lost one parent, they weren't gonna lose another. I used to pray that nothing bad would happen to me or my husband or my kids. Now I pray that whatever happens in my life, I have the wisdom, the strength, the power, the faith, and the people to not just survive it, but to thrive after it, because this life is so worth living all in.